Daniel, one of the most interesting books in the Old Testament. One of the most authenticated books of the Old Testament. But all of that academic uh, stuff is behind us if we just focus on one issue, and that is it was translated into Greek 270 B.C. as part of the Septuagint version. So the book of Daniel was in black and white almost three centuries ago. And is it a fascinating book because it lays out our history right now in advance. So it's an interesting book. It's one of the few books in the Bible which focuses on Gentile dominion. Most of the Bible anticipates history through the lens of Israel, God's chosen people. But there are a couple of chapters, namely Daniel 2 and 7, that will be a part of our, our overall study, in which Gentile, the Gentile world is in focus. And suggestive of that, Daniel chapter 2 through 7 is written in a Gentile language. Daniel is ob obviously fluent in many languages, Hebrew, of course, because he was raised under the revival of King Josiah. But he also was taught Ar Aramaic, or Chaldean, if you will, uh, by being deported as a teenager and put in postgraduate school to serve at court. His dramatic career survives two empires, not only the Babylonian Empire, but we'll see shortly the uh, Persian Empire as well. Was, uh, what he, was, he, he, ro he rose to second or third in the kingdom. So it's an in he's an interesting guy, but Daniel chapter 2 through 7 is written to the Gentiles. Very unusual part of the Bible in that regard. In fact, chapter 4 we'll look at next time we get together will be written by a Gentile king. It's an affidavit by the, king of the, by the ruler of the world that was published throughout the world. Very interesting chapter in the Bible. But we're in chapter 3 tonight. In chapter 3. And as we read chapter 3, we will suffer from a disadvantage in being overly familiar with it. Chapter 3 is such a familiar story, there's a tendency of all of us uh, to look at it as a, one of these colorful, well-known tales out of a Sunday school book. We almost have to keep reminding ourselves, this is reality, it really happened. Daniel and his, th Daniel and his three friends were deported as teenagers. And early in Nebuchadnezzar's career as a young king, he was a general of the army, defeated Pharaoh Necho of uh, Egypt, which established the Babylonian Empire, laid siege to Jerusalem on his way home, during which his father dies, Nabonidus dies. So he's now king of Babylon. So he returns home, takes the throne, encounters these cronies that his father had assembled as his advisors, puts them to a test in chapter 2. He has this weird dream, and he insists that they interpret the dream, but not with him telling what it is. Now, you tell me what the dream is and what it meant a job that they didn't find too <laughs> attractive. And you all know the story. They were ordered to be put to death, but Daniel, who was in that job classification, through prayer, steps forward, and God reveals to Daniel, therefore to the king, both the dream and the interpretation. And we studied that last week. But basically, basically an overview of all of world history in advance. Fascinating dream. Fascinating idiom. But the vocabulary used was that of a tall, polymetallic image, head of gold, uh, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and then the feet iron mixed with clay. Famous vision. Daniel chapter, and of course, Daniel upstaging these advisors who couldn't cut the mustard, but Daniel of course does. God reveals through Daniel to the king this dream, which, of course, obviously impressed the king, and, of course, Daniel interprets it for us. So Daniel chapter 2 lays that all out for us. And, of course, the king is very impressed, so he promotes Daniel and his three associates, Hananiah, uh, um, Michelle, and Azariah. Strange names to us, because we all know their names. We know their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because of the, the song. But these three guys, and Daniel as their leader, are promoted to the highest, some of the highest positions in the court. And you know human nature well enough to know how grateful these other advisors were. Now Daniel's performance saved their bacon. They were going to get killed. And Daniel's performance caused them all to be spared. Daniel promoted them spared. So you can imagine how impressed they were with Daniel. Grateful? No. Gratitude really isn't a bureaucratic attribute. They were watching for their chance. Now, some scholars believe that Daniel chapter 3 probably occurred in something like uh, 18, 20 years later. That's something as you read the book of Daniel, you don't realize the space between the chapters. This occurred much, much later, it would seem. So as we encounter chapter 3, get the perspective. 
The performance of Daniel, of course, had become a legend, probably the subject of quips and, and nursery rhymes among the children, who now are grown. But these old codgers in the wings are watching for their chance to give them their comeuppance. And that sort of sets the stage for Daniel chapter 3, which I like to call Bow or Burn. <laughs> Some of you might prefer the title The Rival's Revenge, except it doesn't quite turn out that way. But as we encounter chapter 3, let's try to give it in our own mind some reality. And let's remind ourselves that you and I, like Daniel and his friends, never know what adventures lie ahead. These guys had their adventures in Babylon, but suddenly they're confronted with this plot, and their lives are at risk. You and I are sitting here tonight in a Bible study, but it doesn't take much awareness to look around the world, whether you're looking at the Middle East, Europe, Russia, what have you, and you realize this world is in turbulence. You can look at our major cities, you can look at our own administration, you can just, you know, this world is changing dramatically. Most of the rules and presumptions and attitudes that we harbored for maybe many decades are out the window. So you and I will probably have, shortly, might be tomorrow, might be next week, might be months or years away, but there's a likelihood that you and I are going to be confronted with some pretty dramatic adventures also. And so we might do well to keep an eye on how these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo, dealt with this one. Now, a lot of this may be familiar to you if you saw the CBS special. As you know, that we participate as consultants to CBS for three primetime specials, Ancient Secrets of the Bible 1 and 2 and then another thing. And it was Ancient Secrets of the Bible 2 that they happened to deal with this particular episode, the book of Daniel. So you may, some of you may remember that if you watched that primetime special. So, and of course, what we're going to encounter here <laughs> is um, a metal image again. And many people who read the chapter don't link it to chapter two. See, chapter two, the the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the head was of gold, and that represented Babylon. The arms and uh, chest were of silver, which represented the succeeding empire destined to be the Persians and so forth. This is a couple of decades later, maybe. Uh, certainly some time has passed, and Nebuchadnezzar is put on an ego trip by his advisors. How tragic it is that many people in power are really the pawns of his advisors. But that's reality. And these guys apparently have contrived this situation, partly to feed his ego, but partly to set the stage for what they felt would be a suitable comeuppance for the performance that embarrassed them some time prior. So let's jump in. Chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Not just a head of gold, the whole image was of gold. And the height of it was three score cubits, and the breadth of it was six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This image, first of all, is all of gold. This becomes idiomatic or symbolic of his statement that he's going to live forever. So he's not, there's no acknowledgment of being replaced by the silver, the bronze, etc., the idioms of the, of the vision. It's 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. And like Bill Cosby, you're probably saying, what's a cubit? Huh? And we won't get into that debate. You, I can give you authoritative references anywhere from 14 to 28 inches, but... If you assume 18 inches, you're probably close to the best scholarship around. The Babylonian cubit was not the same as the Hebrew cubit, but the difference is technical. It's a matter of a few inches. So let's, if you, in your mind's eye, visualize a cubit as being 18 inches, foot and a half, the elbow to the tip of the finger, it would seem, but again, who's, you know? So, um, so this is a, a strange, almost an obelisk kind of thing. You say, you know, it's, it's interesting, scholars say you couldn't, that they didn't have the technology to build something that high. That's ridiculous. The Colossus of Rhodes was 70 cubits high. So that sort of conjecture is just incompetent. But we notice something here. If you're an alert Bible student, you are tuned to numbers. And what does seven mean? And I'm not talking at Las Vegas. What does seven mean? Anyone? Perfection. Almost. Almost. If you say perfection in the sense of completion, right on. 
Many people have been told that seven is divine or holy. Wrong. Satan has seven heads. Seven is used biblically, and the way you determine it, no, no, no profound issue here other than going through a concordance, listing all the places they occur, and drawing, a, drawing an inductive inference as to how it's being used. And seven is, seems to always imply completion, perfection in the sense that it's perfect or complete. There are so many things about God that is complete, so the number is often attributed to God, but be careful. The number can also be attributed in certain contexts that are quite the opposite. That means completion. If you take one away from seven, you get that which is imperfect. Incomplete, wanting, and not surprisingly, that's the number of man. You betcha. <laughs> man was created on the sixth day in Genesis. Goliath, this big man, was numbered in sixes all over there. Um, there were six steps to Solomon's throne, um, and on it goes. The menorah in the tabernacle was a lampstand, one with six branches, the one plus six being the complete. I am the vine, ye are the branches. I am the light of the world, etc. The I am statements that make up the Gospel of John being, of course, anticipated in the structure and design of the tabernacle, as an, as an example. But again, we have this idea that it's six plus one that makes the seven, and that without that one, man is incomplete. And the number six, of course, speaks of man, and the extension of that number, 666, will, of course, allude to Satan's man. And before we're all through, we'll talk more about that in these studies. Um, it's interesting that in our society, we're in Babylon here in chapter 3, but in our society, we're in a world that deifies man. It's in the form of humanism. It has a creed. It's the official doctrine of the United States and its administration. And uh, as you get alert to that, you can get increasingly concerned in the directions we're going. The ultimate expression of that deification of man will emerge in Revelation chapter 13. There will be a coming world leader on the scene. Most scholars that are competent here believe he's alive today. He won't be revealed until the church is gone, we believe, because of 2 Thessalonians 2. But the point is, he's a lot probably around. There's a cohort of his that will cause the world to worship him. <coughs> And we'll talk a little bit more about that before this evening's over. But I, I call it to your attention because that's so familiar to us if you've studied Revelation or you've studied the end-time prophecies of the Bible. It's interesting that here in Daniel 3 we seem to have an anticipation of that. If you're watching the, the, the narrative carefully, you'll, you notice it's just peppered with allusions and symbols that echo the end times. And so there's... a, a, a several purposes for us jumping in this chapter. One, of course, is the next chapter in Daniel, but also it's a key part of the Old Testament background, but m perhaps most relevant to you and I. It's also a hint and, and, and a focus on those things that are very of, 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 of substantial interest to all of us. If we were studying Bible prophecy 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago or whatever, many of these things would be sort of academic. Today, an awareness of these is almost essential if you're going to understand what's going on in CNN every day or the newspaper, or what have you, because it's, we are plunging into uh, what I like to call the times of the signs, because they're all happening. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar builds this image, three score cubits high, six cubits wide, sets it up in the plain of Dura. Now, Dura is a Chaldean word simply meaning enclosed by a wall, but it's a specific area that's approximately six miles southeast of Babylon. And Babylon is on the map. You can go visit there. You want to make sure you arrange a round-trip ticket. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that uh, on our CBS special, uh, Dr. William Shade, professor of uh, Old Testament uh, history, uh, highlighted in the, in the special, if you recall, that in 1956, as a result of uh, publishing certain tablets by the British Museum, they discovered there was recorded a revolt in 596 uh, B.C., which may have set the stage, an attempted revolt, for Nebuchadnezzar to conduct some kind of a event for them to reaffirm their allegiance and swear allegiance to him. And that it's possible that that historical account may give us a little coloration of what may have led to this peculiar um, event organized by his advisors. Verse 2, the Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. 
Now these terms in the King James are slightly different if you get into the background of them. Instead of princes, it's Asher Hardapan, which is actually a satrap, which is like a chief representative or administrator of the king. The term governor is actually Sagan, which is like a prefect. He's actually a military commander. You don't get that. In the, you know, we use those terms a little differently. So the, not that it's a big deal, but just to give you a little flavor of this. Where it says captains in here, the peha are really civil governors, is what the term really alluded to. And uh, uh, the judges, the ardegazers, are counselors or arbitrators. Treasurers, are the gedebar, are treasurers, as we think of them. Counselors are debtors, which are lawyers, as we think of them. We call them counselors too, don't we? But see, it's counselor in that sense. It's a, and then um, sheriffs are tiptes. They're magistrates or judges. So some of those terms are used a little differently in the English, but uh, it's not really relevant because really all the all the heavy dues are are uh, to come here. And so he, call, he calls in verse 3, Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the king, excuse me, before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages. Interesting, by the way. Remember this. Don't visualize Babylon as a quaint little city-state. It was prior to his father, Nebuchadnezzar. It was a pawn of Assyrian politics. We're looking at an empire. Because of Nebuchadnezzar's generalship under his father, he essentially conquered the known world. And when his father died, of course, he's now king. We're talking about an empire. What was to them a global empire? We don't know its extent. There's guesses, but I don't think that we know. We know from Daniel chapter 2 that God had given to him everything. Birds, animals, it's a strange... From, from, from a biblical point of view, he was numero uno on the earth as a king. He was, he's a heavy dude. So when you notice here, the herald cries, O oh, oh, people and nations and languages. You need to have a little more cosmopolitan horizon here. Five. That at the time that ye hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now, he explains this invitation a little more clearly in verse 6. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, if you follow heavy metal music, this hot music group gives Metallica a whole new meaning. Right? <laughs> we'll discover, of course, that the Christian equivalent of Metallica is what? The uh, deliverance? And that's exactly what the young guys get. So I just have to work those puns in a little bit here. Okay. Now, a ton-up or execution furnace has been discovered in Iraq. And there is uh, uh, record uh, evidence from records that they did indulge in furnace executions in this period, which is kind of interesting. Now, what we have going on here is, in effect enforced state religion. And that's exactly what we see described in Revelation 13, 14, and hinted at 19 and 20, and we'll look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 before the evening's over. So there is a prophetic analogy <laughs> apparently being built up here. And if you know my particular views of the Scripture, I believe that these 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years are a single message system that's supernaturally engineered from outside our time domain. You can prove that. With that point of view, as you start discovering that these 66 books are tightly engineered, even though written over thousands of years by 40 different guys, you'd begin to discover there was supernatural engineering going on, which also is the basis by which we begin to realize that there's nothing in here by accident. And so as these stories, as these narratives actually happen on the one hand and yet are also edited in some subtle ways, so as to conform with something yet to happen. We'll talk a little bit more about that after we get through the, 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 the basics here. Now those of you also that saw the um, CBS special know that Dr. Ron Charles uh, designed, a furnace, designed furnaces for Owens Corning, but he also uh, uh, presented a conje con uh, conjectural design uh, taken from some evidence, 32, uh, 32 feet high, two-story, 32 feet high, 
uh, 20 feet with a basic chamber and then 12 uh, feet with a brick baking chamber. And he pointed out that looking at the design of the way, the way they apparently built some of these chambers, that the seven officers are going to get killed here in a moment probably did get hit with a backdraft. And that's somewhat predictable. He also points out something I don't buy, but I'll just share with you for completeness. He also points out that it's conceivable that someone could survive a furnace like that due to the presence of cold spots. But I'll show you quickly why that doesn't fit the narrative. Because this cold spot was very, very peculiar because it, it um, not only preserved the guys, but got rid of their, bi their bindings. That's a very, very selective fire. So, um. <laughs> But let's us just move on. Now, it's interesting. Uh, this is the basic set. We've got this image. Everybody's supposed to, when the music plays, you're supposed to bow down and worship. If you don't, off with your head. Capital crime for not worshiping. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Eighty-five people in Waco got murdered because they didn't have politically correct views. Kind of interesting. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now the Jew term here, of course, is used in the context of these particular deportees, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They spoke and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear that shall hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of the fiery furnace. You signed the memo, okay. Verse 12, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. See, they got promoted at the end of chapter 2, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Shadrach is the Babylonian. It means illumined by the sun god. Their Hebrew name, his Hebrew name was Hananiah, which means beloved of the Lord. See, they had Jewish names, but when they were deported, they were given Babylonian names. Just as the Jewish name had the name of God in it, that was their style in those days, um, the Babylonians renamed them and, and, and tied them to one of the gods they worshipped. Shadrach, illumined by the sun god. Meshach means who is like unto the moon god. And his name really was Mishael, who is like God. Abednego was the, means the servant of Nego, or the shining fire. And his real name was Azariah, the Lord is my help. But see, we know them not by Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's kind of interesting, my friends, that there was a five-sided clay prism found at Babylon that is presently on display at the Istanbul Museum. This was all shown on CBS last year. And uh, it has lists, and by a group by title. And it mentioned Ahanunu, which is chief of the royal merchants, a, which is a variation, incidentally, of Hananiah, or Shadrach. There is a Mushal Ad Marduk, and if you take Marduk, the name of God, out of that, it becomes essentially Meshach. And the third guy is R.D. Nabu, which is uh, secretary of the crown prince, which is an alternative form of Abednego, or Abednego. It's interesting that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are listed in the cuneiform tablets with prominent positions before the king. That's kind of fun. Kind of interesting, I think. Now, why would they not worship Because uh, uh, worship with the music is because it was prohibited by the Torah. We won't take the time to look at it, but in, the, in Exodus chapter 20, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not make graven image or bow down and so forth. Leviticus 26.1, same kind of thought. Deuteronomy 16.22. Clearly, a devout Jew will not bow down to any graven image. And these guys had done their homework. They knew that they wouldn't. This whole thing was probably contrived by them to get these guys on the spot. And now they're tattling to the king, watch out for these three guys. Verse 13, the Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's strange. Why didn't he just kill them? That was his order. He apparently has regard for these three guys. He wants to give them a second chance. He pleads with them in effect. They don't, you know, let's get serious, guys. He's on the spot. He's got to back his own decree. And yet... He's hoping that he can find some kind of thing going on here. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at that time that ye hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? 
Good question. Isn't it glib to sit on the sidelines and say, Watch, King, these guys are going to be all taken care of? Because we read the story, right? <laughs> Tomorrow, or next Thursday, when you're confronted with a choice, will you have the same confidence and courage and commitment to your Lord that these three guys had to theirs? Notice how they handle this. I love this scene. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not cautious to answer thee in this matter. We're not anxious. Remember, they said, be careful for nothing. The word really means anxious. Be, we're not anxious, king, to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Or in the Missler translation, they says, Up yours, O king. <laughs> Remember what Job said in chapter 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job 13, 15. You can also like Acts 4, 19, where Peter says the same thing. Are we to regard God or men? glibly said when you're reading and glibly nodded, nodded to an agreement when we're in a group like this but what about tomorrow or the next day when you're on the firing line interesting question Hebrews 12 29 quotes Deuteronomy 4 24 pointing out that our God is a consuming fire so let's see what God does in this consuming fire verse 19 then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. That's turning up the heat, huh? And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army, that was a mistake, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their stockings and their turbans and the other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, never be in a rush, gang. Because his commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That sounds fanciful until you realize that this thing was turned up seven times hotter than it normally is, and there's a thing called a backdraft. If you haven't seen the movie Backdraft, uh, you're in for a treat. It's well done. It gives you some feeling for what these guys face with uncontrolled fire. And so that's, that's probably uh, pretty straightforward stuff. But now it gets really interesting. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king was astounded and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound? Two points. How many? Three. And weren't they bound into the midst of the fire? And he answered and said to him, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Not three, four, and not bound, loose, walking around, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Bar Elohim, which is Aramaic, which is equivalent to the Hebrew, the Bar Elohim. Your King James Bible probably has it, the Son of God. Some of these smart Alex say, well, it really says sons of gods, or like the son of the gods. And that's technically true. Bar Elohim means the son of the gods, except you... You see, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Barashit bara Elohim. In the beginning created God. The heavens and the earth. The word is Elohim. The word Elohim is one of the several names that is used of God in the Bible. Speaking of the Creator God. You know enough Hebrew to realize that Elohim is a plural noun. A cherub and I'm talking about the Renaissance concept. The biblical concept of a cherub is a super angel. What is more than one called? Cherubim. 
Isaiah chapter uh, speaks, 6 speaks of seraphs, and a plural is seraphim. Certain Hebrew nouns are made plurals by adding uh, what we would call I am. So Elohim is a plural noun. But every time you see it in the Bible, there is a grammatical error, believe it or not. In English, we're not so conscious of it, but if you learned a foreign language, you know that most of them, you have, to, you have to decline the verbs and nouns and stuff to agree with the number and the gender and all that business. And you go through these tedious exercises of memorizing declensions. And the idea is that a noun is supposed to agree with the verb, right? Every time that Elohim is used in the Bible, it violates the rules of grammar because the word Elohim is a plural, but it's always used with a verb as if it's a noun. Now, the only place you see that, you see that a couple, it shows up a couple places in the English. When God says, let us make man in our own image. Who's he talking to? See, it's interesting. Now, I'll tell you something else, as long as we've gone this far. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Barashit bara Elohim, in the beginning created God, the heavens and the earth. But afterward, Elohim, there are two letters that are not translated. Those two letters usually I mean with or a preposition, but that's if it's connected. They're floating. Two letters floating after the word Elohim. The first of the two letters is an Aleph, and the second of the two letters is a Tauf. And what it actually says, you remember in Isaiah, God says, I'm the first and the last? It says that three times, chapter 41, 44, and 48. Book of Revelation, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega, right? He says that, what, three or four times in there? Who is alive and now, who is alive and of dead, and now I'm alive forevermore, right? Eight times, I think it is, in the book of Revelation, that equivalent phrase is used. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning created God, the Aleph and the Tau, the heavens and the earth. The Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The Tau is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If you translate that strictly in the Greek, you'd say, In the beginning, God, the Alpha and the Omega, created the heavens and the earth. Zechariah chapter 12, 10. And they, speaking of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and they shall look upon me whom they pierce. And if you look at that in the Hebrew, between the me and the whom, there's two floating letters, the Aleph and the Tau. What it actually says is they shall look upon me, the Aleph and the Tau, whom they pierced. In the Greek, it would say the Alpha and the Omega. In the English, it should say the A and the Z, or idiomatically, the first and the last. Kind of exciting. So who is this guy? Well, it's the son of the gods. No. The Elohim is the Aramaic equivalent of the Hebrew bar Elohim. I believe, and scholars can argue about this if they like, I believe. He's certainly an angel. That's identified in verse 28. But I believe it is the angel. And when you've got a very simple idea to impress your friends, you always give it a fancy name. It's called a theophany. An Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And I think that's kind of exciting. These guys had quite a visitor. Quite a visitor. And they were walking around loose. The only thing the fire burned was their bondage, their bindings. I think that's kind of fun. Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of who? The Most High God, El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth. That's the title he used. Come forth and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hung around a while. They had a good visitor. No, they did come forth from the midst of the fire. I, that's the part of the story that I don't understand. If I was in that fire with the creator of the universe, you'd have a tough time talking me out of there. <laughs> By the way, Nebuchadnezzar uses the term Most High God, which is a good pagan, Gentile-oriented kind of term. In other words, the Most High God. He doesn't use Yahweh, or Jehovah, as you might say. That's the covenant relationship with Israel. I'm fascinated by these turkeys that take the book of Genesis and notice that they don't always use the same word for God. And that obviously proves that we're different guys writing. Nonsense. The name of God is always the name that's appropriate to the passage. If it's the Creator God, it's the Elohim. If it's the covenant relationship, it's Jehovah, or Yahweh, or however you prefer. The unpronounceable name, etc. So it's interesting, they're all the, El Shaddai, the Almighty. There's all these different names in the Bible, and they're always carefully selected to highlight that particular attribute of God that's relevant to the passage. So these people that criticize are manifesting their lack of background. So when you see the PhDs and the H2SO4s behind their name, 
Uh, don't be impressed. See what God really says here. Verse 27, the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men up whom, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. That's pretty, that's pretty neat. Oh, here's my note about the furnace. I was going to mention that. North, in North Iraq. A brick furnace is the size of a city block. Uh, primary, uh, uh, primarily burning pitch and sulfur, and they had bellows to get the heat out. That's how they control the temperature. It's interesting to me that Nebuchadnezzar's palace has been rebuilt by Saddam Hussein. Old news. He used it for affairs of state since 1987. And of course, not a target of the Persian Gulf War, because our focus was on Baghdad, not Babylon. This is not a military target. Some ceremonial buildings. But I wonder if Saddam Hussein has built any of these furnaces. That'd be exciting. Anyway. Nebuchadnezzar refers in verse 26 to the Most High God. I don't want to get ahead of our story, but you'll, I personally regard Nebuchadnezzar as an interesting guy. The more you study about him, he is my kind of guy. He didn't mess around. He, I believe he was saved. I believe when I get to heaven, I'm going to look him up, because i got a lot of things I'd like to talk to him about. <laughs> and my basis for that is chapter 4, because he signs an affidavit and publishes it to the world about his testimony. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. And that's yet ahead of the story, because he's not saved yet. Now, um, <coughs> as you read these stories, it's always kind of neat to try to extract from them not only some overall... It's, it, we like to extract some things that teach us about the Bible, obviously. We like to get some perspectives. That's always very valuable. But we also like to take something away that we can use next week, right? I'm going to suggest to you that God's servants never know true spiritual liberty until they're cast in the midst of a furnace. Your pain becomes one of your spiritual credentials. Your mistakes become your lessons. But your pain is one of your credentials. And you probably will never really discover your spiritual liberty until you're in a fiery furnace. So you want to get into the furnace because Christ will be there with you. And that's the great discovery. That was their great discovery. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ because he was the first with him. They made their commitment up front. He honored it. You're going to have an opportunity under our present administration to stand up for Jesus Christ at great pain and great penalty. The soft, easy-going, socially fashionable, politically correct days of being a Christian are way behind us. The ungodly, the pagans are in control, and they have an aggressive agenda. And, and they are publishing documents that describe dangerous religious cultists. And if you read those, they're very interesting definitions. People who have an excessive preoccupation with the Bible and the second coming of Jesus Christ. People who think that Armageddon is just around the corner. These are the definitions of dangerous religious cult cultists, and I volunteer. <laughs> Spurgeon made an interesting thing. He says, Though the smell of fire had not passed on them, it must have left a glow on their countenances and a glory on their persons, which we find nowhere else. Henceforth they are called the three holy children. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and hath changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Nebuchadnezzar got the point. Kind of neat. It's interesting. It's Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. It tells us who was in the fiery furnace in the first place. This wasn't a story. They carried out. He saw it and re responded to it. Now, he's my kind of guy. He didn't mess around. Look at verse 29. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar continuing, I make a decree that every people and nation and language who speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their, homes shall, their houses shall be made a refuse heap, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. That was addressed, I think, specifically to those guys in the back row that put him up to this whole deal. <laughs> Now the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And chapter 4 is a memorandum written to the world. 
by this king. And we'll get into that next time. A couple of interesting things that we, uh, uh, we should just take a look at. Because we, we, we have this familiar story, really happened, very key event, and yet the Holy Spirit, I believe, would use it to convey to you tonight some other insights. Some other insights. Uh, hold your place here, but turn to Revelation chapter 13. Everybody talks about the Antichrist. He has 33 titles in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. Now we're not talking about one guy, we're talking about a duet, two guys. And the clearest place of that is here in chapter 13. Chapter 13 verse 1 talks about the first beast, this coming world leader. When you get to verse 11, another subject is introduced. A second guy. The first beast rises out of the sea, which gives him a Gentile coloring, prophetically. The second beast rises out of the earth, which typically is a Jewish coloring. Verse 11, I beheld another beast coming out of, out of the earth, and he had two horns like the lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Who's the lamb? Our Lord. Who's the dragon? Satan. Authority? Previous chapter, verse 9, but we'll move on. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him, but causes the earth and them who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, earlier when the first beast is talked about, one of his characteristics, many things introduced, but the one that seems to be picked up as a repetitive identifier is that he apparently has a head wound and is healed. Everybody thinks he's dead. He's brought back to life. So that's, you'll see that come up a lot. Uh, but also something else. The book of Revelation deals with several groups of people, and one of the important groups to watch for are the earth dwellers, those that dwell upon the earth. That ain't us, I hope. Our citizenship is in heaven. It uses the term not as a position of place, but a position of heart. Those that dwell upon the earth. If you want your sense of that, the whole thing starts to become a lot clearer. Anyway, those, uh, he, 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 he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound is healed. So he's going to enforce worship. And he doeth great wonders. The word there means miracles. We're not ready for that. We see these turkeys that get elected to office and you wonder, what do they got? There's going to be a guy's surface. He's going to do miracles. And we're not ready for that. Church isn't ready for that. We're not used to the idea that satanic powers can do miracles. We're not prepared. We haven't done our homework in demonology. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Duplicating, counterfeiting perhaps, the miracles in chapter 11 of these two special guys. And he receiveth them that dwell upon the earth by the means of those... And he deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the same means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell upon the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had the wound by the sword and did live. In other words, again, that's the, it's an image of the first beast. The second guy, the second leader, creates an image of the first guy and causes everybody to worship the first guy through that image. See the analogies building here with Daniel 3. And he hath the power to give life to the image of the beast have no idea what that means. But in our technology today, it doesn't surprise us at all. That the image of the beast should both speak and, that, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We're talking serious stuff here. State enforced religion. Watch for it. <laughs> and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and enslaved, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads so that no man might buy or sell, except that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. And boy, we could spend some time on this thing. Let me suggest, as a guy that studied this for 40 years and taught it for 20, that practically all of the conjectures that have been passed on to me by well-meaning friends, and I think I've seen most of them, I don't happen to be too impressed with. Gamatria, maybe, but that has to be in Hebrew and Greek, not one of the other languages for lots of reasons. I strongly encourage you not to get caught up in worrying about 666 because 
From 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe it's an issue that is aimed at those that are left behind. All those people who are in churches who don't need new pastors after the rapture might want to do a lot of homework on this. <laughs> but, uh, what most of you may not realize is that in Ezekiel chapter 9, there is a marking that is given by God for those that will be protected by God. And this marking here may be like everything else Satan does, a counterfeit of what God is doing. Everybody likes to say, well, gee, they, we, they get all hung up with barcodes. Or they get all hung up with uh, microchips. I came from the semiconductor industry. I was on the board of Ramtron that made the chips that go into cattle and stuff. They can insert with a gun. Yes, and, and they can monitor you and all that. In fact, we uh, also was a, the company that manufactured uh, devices that allow you to be tracked by satellite. And most of the foreign operatives in this country are so marked and used by enforcement agencies to keep track of where they are in New York and so forth. Um, and so people get hung up on that and say, gee, is that the technology that's involved in chapter 13, verse 18? Maybe it is, but I think it misses the point. It's not your number that's the issue here. It's his number. Why is it on the forehead and the hand? Because we only have one physical description of this guy in the Bible. It's the last verse of Zechariah chapter 11. You might want to pop over to Zechariah chapter 11. I'm not, I don't want to derail this into a whole study of this leader, but let me just nail a couple of things that I know will come up. Revel uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, last verse in that chapter. Woe to the idol, I-D-O-L, shepherd. That's an allusion to this. This is, one of the, this is one of the 33 titles in the Old Testament of this guy. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. And his arm shall be completely dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. That's all we know about him physically. He apparently has a head wound, comes back to life, but he's got some incapacities left, residual, if you will. And there's one eye and one arm is in inoperative. That apparently becomes a characteristic. Doesn't say he's got a map of Italy on his forehead or any of that sort of thing. <laughs> My presumption is, is that this mark that people will take will be a symbol of identification with him. Yes, it may be involved with barcodes or identifiers, not disparaging that, but most things I've seen miss the point is identifying with that guy. And if you take that mark, it's over. You say, can you lose your salvation? Yes, take a mark. I don't, know any, I don't know of any other way. It doesn't apply to us for lots of reasons. That's a whole other thing. Now, why am I getting this here? Because let's think in terms of Daniel chapter 3. We have Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon. Where did all false religions start? At Babel, founded by Nimrod, who enforced a world religion at the time. That's what Genesis 11 is all about. This same town is the town that Nebuchadnezzar is now running, and this same town is the one that's being rebuilt on the banks of the Euphrates as we speak. Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51 make it clear that Babylon will re be rebuilt on the banks of the Euphrates. And I didn't buy that in the early years because I believed all this balderdash and the commentaries are full of that Babylon was destroyed in 539 B.C. Wrong, it was conquered. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 5. Babylon's never been destroyed the way the Bible predicts it will be. The conditions are very, very clear and very, very explicit in three, in, in six chapters. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18 deals with the fall of Babylon. Is it allegorical? Yes. Is it literal? Yes. Both are true. How does it get back to Babylon? Zechariah 5, 15, 5, Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 15 tells you about how it's going to be relocated back to Babylon, to the plain of uh, Shinar. But it's interesting, in chapter 3 you have Nebuchadnezzar, a world leader enforcing his image to be worshipped at pain of death. Does that sort of sound prophetically like a type, right? Now let me just indulge a little bit about what we call types, what we would call in our vernacular models. Hosea 12.10, God tells us that he does deal in metaphors, similes, models, and analogies. And the Bible is full of them. The most famous one, of course, is Genesis 22, when Abraham offers Isaac. We all know that Abram offered Isaac. We also know Abram knew he was acting out prophecy because he names the place after it's all over. In the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen. It's prophetic. And he offers Isaac on the top of the mountain, Mount Moriah. And of course at the last minute there's a switch and that Ram is a substitute. But the point is, 2,000 years later on that very spot, another father offers his son as an offering for sin. 
That place that Abraham was offering is now known as Golgotha. You can go visit it. But it's interesting, as you study these types and so forth, you study a couple chapters later, chapter 24 in Genesis, you find that Abraham commissions his servant to gather a bride for Isaac. And you study that, then you discover that again is a type, where Abraham's the father, Isaac's the son. The, uh, the uh, servant gathering the bride is a type of what? Holy Spirit, right. You can't find his name there. You have to go to chapter 15 and find his name. His name is Eliezer, which means comforter. What makes that whole thing really interesting is that in, chap in verse 19 of Genesis 22, when the whole thing's over, the angels bless them, and it says, Abraham goes down the bottom of the hill, picks up the two young men and the donkey that were waiting, and they went home. And what you discover is, where's Isaac? Isaac obviously went home, but doesn't say that. Abraham went down the hill, picked up two guys, they went home. The name of Isaac turns out to be edited out of the record from the time he's offered until he's united with his bride at the well of living water two chapters later. Holy Spirit has taken liberties with the text to edit his name out. By context, obviously Abraham and Isaac, the two men went home, but that's not what it says. Holy Spirit hovers over every word, every number, every place of name. So what I want to tune you into is watch not only what the Bible says, notice the omissions. In Genesis 22 and 24, the famous type studies of Abraham offering Isaac, notice that Isaac isn't there from the time he's offered until he's united his bride. Now, obviously, he really was there, but the Holy Spirit has bent that text so that it becomes a model of the New Testament. That's what the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. One book, 66 books by 40 authors over thousands of years, and yet engineered by the Holy Spirit. Now, we have this very familiar story of... Chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, gee, sounds like a type of the Antichrist. We've got the 60 and 6, the 666 is lurking behind the symbols there. We have these three Jewish young men preserved through the fire. I'll give you a bunch of texts which point out that fire is a, is a symbol of the tribulation. So these three young men are viewed by many scholars as idiomatic of Israel through the tribulation, the, the remnant, if you like, the 144,000, if you like, that all sort of fits. And, of course, the fiery furnace being an idiom of the tribulation. And we could talk much about that. So I have one question for you tonight, my friends. Where was Daniel? We have this familiar story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you read this story, you'll notice there's something missing. Daniel ain't there. That's kind of interesting. So what are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is he wasn't in the story because he bowed down to the image. How many believe that? Good, you're paying attention. <laughs> the other possibility is he also refused to bow down, but his enemies didn't accuse him. How many believe that story? No. The text is silent on this subject, but what most scholars assume, which is reasonable, is that Daniel was absent. He was, he was number two to the king, and he was on some errand for the king, probably in a foreign country. In fact, it was his absence that probably gave courage to the adversaries to spring this plot to knock off his three buddies. That, incidentally, that five-sided prism that I mentioned, that mentions Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it's also an interesting piece of cuneiform writing, because guess who's not mentioned there either? Daniel. Kind of fun. Now, it's very conjectural, but you're not in the Chuck Mister Bible study without getting something off the wall. It's just a conjecture, but I personally tend to view Daniel as the church in this idiom. There's one prophet in the Old Testament. Well, first of all, Abram had a title, the friend of God. And in the Oaks of Mamre, Genesis 18, that's symbolized by God sharing with him what he's about to do. And he tells him he's about to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, <laughs> Abraham, in an ethnically characteristic way, haggles. What if there's 40 righteous and so on? <laughs> Abraham has a title, the friend of God, and it's linked to knowing the future. Jesus, to his disciples, said, You've been my servants, henceforth ye are my friends. And he then reveals to him in the Upper Room Discourse what's coming. The concept of being God's friend and revealing the future seem to be linked in both the Old and New Testament. Let's take an extreme case of that. There is one prophet in the Old Testament that is known as the beloved prophet. Who is that? Daniel. 
And who is the apocalyptic prophet of the Old Testament? Daniel. Which apostle is known as the beloved one? John. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Isn't that interesting? No big deal other than it appears that those ideas are linked. And I believe it's a natural follow-on from that perspective that Daniel may be metaphorically or typologically modeling the church here. Now that's a real extension. I wouldn't build doctrine on this. It's just an observation. But it's interesting that if that's true, he's not preserved through the fiery furnace. He's not even there. Praise God. There are three groups of people that faced the judgment, the, last, the previous judgment when God judged the earth. The flood of Noah. Three groups of people. Those that perished in the flood. Those that were preserved through the flood, those eight people on the ark. And those that were removed before the flood, namely Enoch, who was born on the 6th of Sivan, the Feast of Pentecost, who was raptured on the Feast of Pentecost, according to the rabbinical traditions. Boy, that's to me very, very provocative and interesting. And I've run a little over. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. When we were in chapter 1, I suggest that we ought, all ought to dare to be a Daniel. Tonight I'd like to share with you the challenge to dare to be an Hananiah, Azariah, or Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys did it right. And you and I are going to have those same kinds of opportunities. Maybe not as dramatic, I hope. <laughs> and yet, watch for them. The most dangerous ones are the subtle ones. Standing by a campfire, do you really know this man? Your speech betrays us. I know I'm not, Peter said. Words uttered in haste and regretted through an eternity. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you. <laughs> we praise you for delivering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We thank you, Father, you, whenever the occasion calls, show yourself strong on behalf of your people. And Father, we'd come before you in accordance with your commandment, asking you to give us also the strength, the courage, the commitment, the insight, the perspective to respond as honorably before you as these three young men did. Only you, Father, know the end from the beginning, and only you, Father, know what lays before each of us that are here gathered. And yet, Father, we would cherish the opportunity to be your servants, your witnesses, relying on your counsel and your might, and not our own strength. Help us, Father, to be ever conscious that you are in control, no matter how hot the flames or how dark the hour. We just praise you, Father, that you are in control, and we thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, and we are all here right now by your divine appointment. And so, Father, we would just seek the utmost benefit of this appointment. We pray, Father, you would increase in each of us a hunger for your word, an appetite for the bread of life. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you to draw each of us into those particular portions of Scripture that will illuminate for each of us that opportunity that is before us to be participants in your grand adventure and not spectators only. We ask these things, Father, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior. We ask these things, Father, that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives and more pleasing in thy sight. And, Father, we also bring before you right now tonight those among us that right now tonight need healing. There are those among us, Father, that we praise you for having healed. We ask you, Father, to touch those lives that still need that touch, Father, that awareness of your presence. We ask, for, ask you, Father, for miracles that will glorify Jesus Christ. We ask not only for medical healing, Father, but the healing of our finances, our marriages, our relationships, for employment, for an awareness of the times that we might properly prepare as good stewards of our family, not only physically but spiritually. But in all these things, Father, we come before your throne in accordance with your commandment, casting our concerns before your feet. We don't hand them over politely, Father. We cast them before your feet trusting you, moment by moment, day by day. 
For we come before you, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bar Elohim that so <laughs> graciously visited our three friends in the furnace. We ask you, Father, to be there with us too. In Jesus' name, amen.